Hello, welcome to my talk. So this is my 17th VSS. I've been coming every year since I was a sophomore undergraduate in 2005. And during that time, I've co-authored 73 talks and posters. And so I thought it'd be sort of fun to think about what those were and sort of reflect on my VSS experience. So what I did is I made a word cloud in the shape of VSS of all of my titles and, and co-authors on all this. And I think it's not a surprise to see that I study sort of visual memory, uh, working memory, ensembles, real-world objects, long-term memory, scenes. One of the nice parts of this is also that it you know, sort of reflects all the people who I've done all this work with, so uh, maybe not, not surprising to see George Alvarez. I've co-authored 19 of these 73 with George, um, Viola Sturmer, Talia Conkel, and of course my PhD advisor, Oliva. And so in many ways this sort of reflects my my VSS experience, and I wish I could tell you about all of it. <laughs> um, in particular, you know, this is my current lab um, and my f and my former lab, and I really wish I could tell you about all the amazing work all of them were up to. Um, the undergraduates from my lab. This is just the ones who've presented first author stuff at VSS. Uh, and of course, I, I don't have time for that, but I will give you a little bit of a, a preview. So some of the amazing things these people work on, some of which are being presented at VSS. Things like. Uh, how we store real-world objects in working memory and long-term memory, and the role of meaning in processing them, the connection between intelligence and working memory capacity, perceptual expertise, like in the case of radiology, the way we encode objects that are familiar or unfamiliar and what we remember right after they disappear, the nature of sort of physics and multiple object tracking, the neural basis of ensemble perception and visual working memory, layout and scenes and how we process scene layout, all of these great things. And I don't have time to tell you about all of that, um, but if you're interested I hope you will go to all of their presentations at VSS this year, um, and of course it being 2021 we also have a YouTube channel <laughs> where you can check out all of their previous presentations as well. But today I'll focus on just sort of one theme of my lab, which is I think the thing that sort of defined my VSS experience for me, which is my transition from sort of a vision scientist and a visual cognition researcher down to basically a memory researcher who's interested in visual memory. And the thing that I sort of noticed in myself and that I notice in everyone is that when we all start studying memory, we all bring with us um, our intuitive theories of how the world works and how memory works. And one really dominant intuitive theory that defines our mental model is the fact that the real world is sort of made up of objects as solid, discrete entities. And we know this from, from really early in infancy. And sort of famously throughout the history of science, theories that reject solid, discrete objects as the unit of thought are really hard to think through. So for example, Einstein rejected quantum mechanics, um, and the NFL had a hard time understanding that things can change uh, size in different temperatures without mass moving, <laughs> um, and I think the same thing is true of sort of memory researchers mental models, that we tend to think in terms of discrete objects in the same way my coffee mug is either in or out of my hand, and this defines the way we study memory. This was certainly true for me, that I talked about memory as though items are sort of either remembered or forgotten, and for example in one of our first VSS presentations on our long-term memory work, you know, the paper turned, the paper said, um, you know, after seeing 1,000 vivid pictures, observers remembered 992 of them, as though some pictures were present and some were absent in your mind, the same way that your mug either is or is not in your hand. And, you know, at VSS 2009, I presented this work with Josh Tenenbaum. This paper says people can hold three or four objects in working memory, something I suspect you'll hear a lot of in the next few days. Um, and this, is, this explicitly appeals to a physical analogy, right? This is as though you, you can hold, <laughs> physically hold, only three of the objects on the display. Um, and some of them are there, and some of them are not there. And I think this is intuitively appealing, <laughs> for all the reasons I just said, uh, but not actually how memory works. Instead, what I'll briefly try to review with you is some evidence we've accumulated that memories are really hierarchical and not item-based, and that we should really be thinking with noise, that is, that memories are continuous in strength, not all or none, and memories are population-based, not point representations. We'll go through these one by one. So memories are hierarchical and structured, not item-based. To demonstrate this, I always like to do a magic trick. So what I'm going to do is show you some playing cards, and I want you to pick one card and remember it. I'll just flash them up briefly. Here's some cards. They go away. 
And now I'm going to read your mind, everyone who's not wearing a tinfoil hat anyway. And I'm going to remove your card in particular. So, ta-da! <laughs> I removed your, your card. Um, and it seems magic. <laughs> but of course the trick here is that actually what I did is I changed all the cards. So even though they, they all remained face cards, they're all different than they were before. Now of course if this had come back with a two of diamonds and a four of spades, you'd have noticed that it was different. And so the idea here is that what you actually had in your mind from that first display was the one specific card I asked you to store, but also some information about the set as a whole, which made you feel pretty confident this was the same set when it came back, even though in fact you had almost no individual item information about all the other items. And the general idea then is that when you're thinking about memory for one, for a display, it's not just a list of items that, that are either present or absent, instead there's some sort of structured representations on top. And we've made this argument in lots of papers and tried to sort of formalize this computationally. So for example, in the case of asking people to remember size of dots, you can show that people's memory of really sort of some item level information, but also some information about the entire set and some information about entire color categories, like the blue ones are pretty big and the green ones are pretty small, and that this influences their memory. In the case of more structured displays, you know, visual textures in this case, we've uh, sort of formalized how you might think about memory in, as sort of a combination of the texture of this, like it looked kind of like horizontal rows, but also I remember these items in particular pretty well. And I think this is not only sort of the way memory works, that it's just generally structured and hierarchical in the same way our visual system is, um, but thinking of memory this way really matters. And so, for example, in debates about sort of how many complex objects people can remember, like these cubes and characters was a really important working memory research for a while. Um, and it turns out, I think we've shown pretty nicely, I think that, that this ends up just sort of confounded with ensemble representations, that many of the tests of this were really just tests of whether people have general information about the entire display. And similarly, I think the same thing is true when we try to study the precision of memory. We often think we're studying the precision of individual items, but the actual precision we measure is not true of any individual item in any individual display. The other items always matter. The sort of the way the other items relate to the current item changes, changes your measure of individual precision. Okay, so that's the hierarchical idea. The second idea is that memories are really continuous in strength and not all or none. And I think the really important part of this is that it turns out not only is this something that seems true, but that we need to take this into account in every measurement of memory we perform. So imagine I show you thousands of real world objects, <laughs> to pick a particular example. And then afterwards I show you one object at a time and I said, did you see this? If you say yes to an object that really was in the set, that's a hit. And if you say yes to an object that wasn't, that's a false alarm. And we can plot your performance, here's my performance on a task like this, by plotting the hit rate against the false alarm rate. And so I did a pretty good job saying yes to the objects that I had really seen, my hit rate was very high, but I also false alarmed quite a bit um, to objects that I had not seen. And it turns out that to interpret this data, we really need to think about the very nature of memory. You literally cannot interpret data from this kind of task without thinking about the nature of memory. And so imagine that my postdoc Maria also did the same task and her performance was over here. So she had slightly fewer hits than me, but also many fewer false alarms than me. You might wonder who had better performance. And it's hard to compare because there's no single measure of performance here. And so to actually compare, you actually have to do something counterfactual. You have to say something like, if Tim had had fewer false alarms, would his hit rate have been higher than Maria's or lower than Maria's? So you need a model to interpret any old, new, or change detection data all the time. And the all or none worldview, the sort of intuitive view, looks at this kind of data and says, what we need to do is correct for guessing. Some of the items Tim had in mind, those are hits we care about, but some he didn't have in mind, and those are false, those false alarm tells us how many of those there are. And so if you think this way, then you're gonna do something like calculate corrected hit rate or percent correct or a K value. And what you're assuming is that effectively for there's some linear relationship here. So every, for every false alarm I had, that was a lucky guess. And so one of my hits was also a lucky guess. So you get a linear relationship. And so if you think that way, then, then you would say Maria remembered more information than Tim. But the continuous worldview looks at this data and sees something different. It says, what's really going on here is not, their guessing is not a useful concept when you have continuous strengths. Instead, there's something like for the items Tim did see, he had some strong memories and some medium memories and some weak memories. 
and for the items Tim didn't see, some of them nevertheless felt very familiar. Maybe they looked just like his real mug. And some most felt pretty unfamiliar. There's some distribution of the strengths of the items. And in this worldview, we say, oh, okay, well, so Tim set some criterion like this. He said yes to all of the memories that were medium or higher. And that ended up with 50% false alarms. So, you know, lots of these were false alarms and also lots of hits. But if Tim had instead had less false alarms, that would have meant he, he shifted his criterion up and only used relatively strong memories to decide. And so he actually would have only lost one hit, but lots of false alarms. And so he would have done actually better than Maria if he'd had the same false alarm rate as Maria. And you could do this if he had a different criterion. And in general, this kind of model of memory is continuous predicts these sort of curvilinear relationships between hits and false alarms and very different than the ones here. And so it turns out <laughs> that when you actually plot hits against false alarms, almost any way you want to manipulate it from long-term memory and working memory using bias or confidence, you find curvilinear relationships here. That is, it looks like memories are continuous in strength, that they vary continuously. And this is really important. <laughs> it turns out that if you use percent correct or hits minus false alarms or K, especially in long-term memory where 100% of recognition memory researchers believe these are curvilinear and that those are invalid measures, um, then you're really just measuring response criteria, not memory performance. And I'll, I'll end with one last positive note about this. We wrote a whole paper about this, but it turns out that if you do what we almost always do in my lab, which is use forced choice, say which of these two things did you see? Well, then now this no longer depends on that same counterfactual reasoning about the shape of the relationship between hits and false alarms. And so this is nearly always preferred. You almost can't go wrong doing forced choice. So you should probably never do change detection or old new unless you're collecting ROC data. You should use forced choice. Okay, the final thing I'll say is that memories are really, I think, population-based and not point representations. What does this mean? Well, in the, the normal way of thinking, we think of memories as sort of points. You, you've got three items, and then maybe they drift over the delay or something, and so you think the blue one was green, but all you know is like which color you think it is. It's just one, one point, like I think that one is green. Instead, the way we've been conceiving of memory lately is really in terms of a signal detection sort of population view. When you haven't seen anything yet, all of your color channels sort of feel equally familiar. And when you see green, it activates not only green, green feels more familiar, but also a color that's like three degrees on the color wheel away from green must also feel more familiar. You can't even tell them apart perceptually. So there's gonna be some function of how much more familiar every color feels once you've seen green. And then during the delay, this function is gonna get sort of corrupted by noise. Each of these familiarity signals is gonna drift up and down. And then you're gonna end up with some combined noise and signal distribution. And if I ask you what color was present, you're gonna say, this one feels the most familiar, so that's the color, I think. And this worldview suggests that what we really have in mind is this entire distribution. So even though we're only probing them on their max, we could ask different questions. So for example, if you instead ask a two alternative force choice test, which of these two was present, people are gonna sort of just look at those two channels and say which one feels more familiar. And so the idea here is there's an entire population of familiarity signals available at test, each with noise. And this is a very different way of thinking. Okay, so I think the idea here is that thinking of discrete objects, my mug is either in my hand or not in my hand, and the avocado is either in my mind or not in my mind is appealing, but not how memory works. Instead, memories are really hierarchical and structured, not item-based, and we should think with noise. We should think about continuous strengths. We should think when you're remembering this avocado, what you have is a sense of many activations of many colors, just in the same way, you know, population codes in neurons. Okay, so I want to end by just saying my thank you. So thank you very much to VSS for choosing me for this honor. Um, and thank you to Viola Sturmer, who uh, basically runs a lab with me at UCSD, um, and both of our labs and all of our students. And I do hope you'll go see all of their presentations. Um, and thank you to my mentors at UCSD, so John Wixton and John Sorensis in particular, but our whole department's amazing. And I want to say some thank yous to uh, my undergraduate mentors, Marvin Chun and Jay McClelland, who really taught me so much as an undergrad and spent so much time with me, um, which is amazing, um, just amazing people. Um, my PhD mentors, so uh, in particular, of course, Ode, um, who shaped my entire career and <laughs> who is amazing. Um, and my, my closest collaborators, um, you know, 19 presentations with George um, and lots with Talia, um, who of course shaped my entire graduate school and postdoc experience. 
And of course, thank you to really everyone in my in my labs, so in my uh, graduate school lab, and in my postdoc lab, all these amazing people, uh, and to my family, <laughs> um, especially my wife Adina and my adorable kids Hannah and Sophia. Thanks.